This is Ethan, and I'm here with Dave, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 99-inch. On this week's episode, we interview legendary jazz trumpet player Wayne Bergeron. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. It's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch you don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Well, here we are, our last two-digit episode of the podcast. Are you feeling sentimental, Ethan? Oh, our podcast just grows up so fast. <laughs> it sure <laughs> does. Soon we'll be in triple digits. We'll have a while in the, uh, the triple digit years, so <laughs> we'll be fine. You know what? I am still very excited about last week's episode, because not only did we get to talk to Trevor Strong of the Arrogant Worms, but we also announced our big two-year anniversary celebration, a free virtual Zoom concert for our Patreon supporters, starring Trevor himself. That is going to be so much fun. So the concert will officially be held live on Saturday, May 8th. And that is our actual two-year anniversary. And it will start at 8 p.m. Burrito Burrito time and 5 p.m. Hollywood Star time. Now, all Patreon supporters and their families, the Internet Leaks tier or above, are invited to join at no extra cost. So that means if you are not yet a Patreon supporter... You still have time. It's not too late. You can join now by heading over to patreon.com slash 2000 inch to get an invite to this exclusive two year anniversary concert event. Plus, you know, you get to support the podcast and get all the other perks of being a member of the Patreon family. Just a reminder to our Patreon family, RSVPs are required as the slots are limited and they're going pretty quickly. So make sure you let Frank know at frank at 2000inch.com as soon as possible if you plan to attend. So remember, if you're not yet a Patreon supporter and you want to attend, be sure to sign up now to reserve your spot by heading over to patreon.com slash 2000inch and support us at the $5 level or above. I am so very excited about our anniversary concert, and I'm also very excited about our brand new segment on the podcast this week called nerd alert nerd alert oh how cool well who do we have queued up for nerd alert this week well if you can actually believe this our patreon supporter listener and personal friend mike minnick actually fact-checked something we said last week what <laughs> no way what a nerd i know and to think he actually thought something we said that's us Dave and Ethan, two of the biggest Weird Al fans ever, that we actually would get something wrong? Wow. Yeah, right. Okay, well, what did Mike say? All right, so get this. On last week's episode, I said the very first Arrogant Worm song to ever get play on the Dr. Demento show was Big Fat Road Manager and not Carrot Juice is Murder. Yeah, I remember that. They were both played on the same show, though. Yeah, well, Mike said, according to the playlist, Carrot Juice is Murder was played first in the second set, and Big Fat Road Manager was played in the fifth set. Well, yeah, obviously we knew that. I know, right? Well, what Mike failed to notice is that the show in question aired on February 19th, 1995, and everyone knows that Prevent Plagiarism Day is observed annually every February 19th. Uh, everyone except Mike Minnick, apparently. Well, to both celebrate that holiday and to avoid plagiarizing the official Dr. Demento set list word for word, I purposely switched the order of the songs as they were played that day. Yeah, of course. And you certainly explained that during the interview. Now, as we know, our intern Frank, he doesn't keep every single thing said in every single interview when he's editing due to Canadian podcast regulations. And because your explanation was several minutes long, he edited it down to a palatable Canadian friendly length, which I guess arose confusion for Mike Fact Checker Minnick. So nice try, Mike Minnick. But you failed our nerd alert test and hereby are banned from ever submitting another incorrect fact to the podcast. Mike, please turn in your membership card at the front desk on the way out. And while we would, of course, be more than happy to play the entire segment unedited as proof, the only unedited recording containing such evidence was unfortunately lost in the mail. Curse you, U.S. mail system!
While speaking of the U.S. mail system, we each receive some pretty stinking majestic gifts from our valued and amazing Patreon supporter, listener, and personal friend, Mike Minnick. Yes, Mike made us something really cool on his 3D printer. It's our podcast name, Exploding Forward, and it's hard to describe, but it reminds me of like when you win on that old solitaire game on the computer and all the cards start like flying forward at you. It looks just like that, but it has our podcast name. Oh, it is so very cool. We're going to post pictures of it over on our official Facebook group, group.2000inch.com. It's on my shelf. It's in a very prominent place. It is a great piece. Thank you so much for sending that, Mike. Oh, you know what that sound means. We have a message on the 347 Spatula Hotline. The 347 Spatula Hotline, the official hotline of Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, is sponsored by Angel Valenzuela and David Cash, two amazing Weird Al fans and podcast supporters. All right, let's check it out. Hey guys, it's Joe Jaffa. I'm calling because I just got my hands on a can of Philo, the latest beer named after a Weird Al reference. On the can itself, it's a picture of Philo in an alien form. So it's not just a coincidence. It's definitely named after Philo from UHF. It's from Ogo Pogo Brewing. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a pastry sour, which is an extremely interesting combination of taste. It blends together well, though, and it's extremely delicious. Sour isn't too overpowering, either. It weighs in at 8.5% ABV. I recommend it to any Weird Al fan that can get it, who happens to be 21 or older. The side of the can has a message, too. It says... Philo is an alien creature from the planet Zarkon, whose sole purpose on Earth is to help a failing UHF station become the envy of a big-name network. He spends his spare time informing the masses of the secrets of the universe. Thanks a lot, guys. Can't wait to listen to the next episode. Cheers. Well, thank you for the phone call, Joe, and thank you for your review of Philo Beer. Now, while we're on the subject of Philo Beer, Dave, you and I each received a pretty stinking majestic gift from our valued and amazing podcast regular and close personal friend, UH Jeff Nucera, our very own cans of Philo Beer. Well, it turns out that the brewery that put out the Philo Beer is located exclusively in California, fortunately very close to where UH Jeff lives, so Jeff was kind enough to pick us up the cans for our collection. Now, I'm not usually a fan of sour beer, but Joe's review is very promising, so I cannot wait to pop myself a Philo beer and check it out. Well, hopefully it doesn't transport you back to the planet Zarkon. <laughs> now, as another segue, thanks to Joe Jaffa, on Saturday, we did our second ever Weird Al fan game night. Well, like our first game night, we played Jackbox over the internet and got to use a ton of Weird Al references that our normie friends wouldn't appreciate. <laughs> we saw some familiar faces from the last game night, but we also saw a bunch of new ones. It was awesome. Remember, everyone's welcome, so please consider stopping by next time we do one. Even if you don't know the games, they're really easy to pick up. And if you're not into playing games, feel free to come by and hang out with us anyway. Again, the response was great, and our listeners want to keep doing these, and so do we, so we're going to plan on doing more in the future. Keep your eyes on group.2000inch.com for any upcoming announcements. If you're a member of that group, you should automatically get invited to the Facebook events when we create them. And the last two events have been on Saturday evenings because Saturday evenings tend to work best for us, but we know that doesn't work for everyone. So we hope to find other days and times for future game nights. Now on Saturday, you know, we're playing the games, we're chatting with friends and listeners. We ended up learning some very exciting news. There's a new Metal Al album coming soon. While the previous Metal Al albums have focused more on Al originals, this album will feature mostly parodies, including some of Al's most popular hits, as well as metal covers of I Think I'm a Clone Now and Twister. Now, also at our game night, we were joined by our friend David Grant, who is our guest on episode 87 Inch, and we are excited to announce that he is now the newest sponsor of the podcast! As we mentioned in our interview back on episode 87 Inch, David Grant has quite a few personas, including Sebastian Shepard, who wrote The Ruins of Our Past. But this week, we want to tell you all about his comedy rap persona, MC Chalkskin. April 1st is the 10-year anniversary of MC Chalkskin's debut album, Fresh Donuts. Fresh Donuts includes a tight baker's dozen, 13 tracks. 
and features guest artists Kathy Robin, Rich Prophet, Arab Money, Lord Zylor, J Man, Candace Theum, and Big Bubba Jr. Be sure to head to wolfinwool.com for more information about MC Chalkskin and David's other great projects. And be sure to pick up Fresh Donuts on iTunes, Amazon, or wherever digital music is sold to celebrate the 10-year anniversary and to check out some pretty stinking majestic comedy rap music. Ethan, I'm glad you're sounding better this week. You seemed pretty upset last week about losing that tagline contest from Burrito Burrito. And as podcast co-hosts, when you enter a contest, I feel it is my right to also reap in the rewards and sow in the failures. Yeah, before losing that contest, the world was our burrito. Burrito. Well, I know how we can resolve this. Let's officially add your submission to the Burrito Burrito ad script that we read on our show each week. Wow, that would definitely cheer me up. Ooh, wait, if they didn't pick your submission, then they might get mad at us for saying it and stop sponsoring us. Well, actually, on that, Alex, who runs Burrito Burrito, after last week's episode, he texted me and said, love the new tagline in the commercial. I said, see, it's a great tagline. He said, couldn't agree more. I wasn't part of the voting. And so I said, yeah, I was robbed. And he said, I tried to tell him. Well, in that case, this week's episode is brought to you in part by vegan Mexican restaurant Burrito Burrito in Troy, New York, home of the two-pound double-wrapped-in-a quesadilla Burrito Burrito. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito. Find them at burritosquared.com and at Burrito Squared on Instagram. And remember, not every burrito is a Burrito Burrito Burrito, but every Burrito 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 can be Burrito Burritoed. From Troy to Uranus, Burrito Burrito is out of this world. Well said, Dave. Wow, I'm feeling a lot better. All right, it's time for this week's interview. Our next guest has played trumpet with everyone from Maynard Ferguson to Weird Al Yankovic. You can hear him on over 400 TV and motion picture soundtracks. Fans of Weird Al will recognize him on Now That's What I Call Polka off of Mandatory Fun, as well as Pokemon. Please welcome to the podcast, Wayne Bergeron. How's it going, Wayne? It's going great. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, yeah, it's my, my pleasure. Dave just did the intro, but there's so much more. You're Grammy nominated, and you went to high school with Weird Al. I did go to high school <laughs> with, uh, with Al. We, uh, I, I, I didn't actually know him that well in high school. Of course, I knew who he was, but uh, you know, he was uh, extremely intelligent. Um, and was moved up two grades, as you know. So he graduated at 16 years old uh, from Linwood High School. Uh, and he, my girlfriend was actually uh, good friends with him. You know, he was with the smart crowd, and, and I, I played trumpet. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that, was <kind> of, <laughs> that was kind of the difference, you know. But uh, I always admired him because I can remember from a young age even, you know, him doing parodies even, you know, as a seventh grader, you know, uh, doing, doing these things he, you know, ended up uh, making a living at. Right. <laughs> Later. He was always a nice guy, yeah. and he was always very popular uh, with that side of the crowd, of course, you know. Yeah. So you never had any classes with him, or did, was he in band with you or anything? Uh, no, no, he was never in band. Uh, you know, he, uh, I think I was in P, we, PE with him. Okay. Uh, but that was it, okay, I think. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember have, being in classes with him. Um it's probably because he was studying. I might have been ditching. Who knows? You know, maybe he was. <laughs> <laughs> we were leading different lives. You know, I was like a, a hot rider. I was in band, but I also had this other life where I was. Uh, I come from, from a family of like racers and mechanics, and so I was really into cars too. So I was hanging around with this hot rod crowd. You know, besides the band geeks, so I had a, <laughs> like a double lifestyle going on. <laughs> oh wow! You never then like were in any high school bands like jammed with Weird Al or anything. You on trumpet, him on a accordion um you know i don't think so there might have been some stuff that he collaborated with i you know my memory is just you know i don't remember i mean he was involved in assemblies and in music and doing different things like that throughout the years you know yeah but uh i can't rem i really can't remember to be honest with you remember uh anything quite quite like that but uh i remember him being enter i just always thought he was funny of course you know because he was uh, he would do these things and oh he would recreate like uh commercials like you know diarrhea diarrhea medication commercials for assemblies and <laughs> wow. things like that just like you know just he was a very funny funny uh funny man and uh, uh you know, I, you know we didn't know he was going to go on to 
you know, to be famous for all this stuff, of course, you right. know, and then, uh, you know, when his stuff yeah. got submitted to Dr. Demento, you know, that was kind of the, the, the start for him. And, uh, anyway, it's, it's, a uh, it's neat to have watched his career just, you know, go crazy over the years. It's pretty amazing to look at, you know, two kids who are in the same high school go on to have such amazing careers. I mean, are there other people from your class in, in Linwood high school that have gone on to, you know, this sort of fame and, and renown that that you and al have um i'm i'm not i'm not sure i mean there's been some very successful uh, there was a great he wasn't in our class but there's a really great great uh, piano player that was a senior when i was a freshman um so al would have been a freshman too uh mark massey who is a, a pretty well-known piano player around la here he's inc he was an incredible musician in high school but of note you know of of, uh, of name maybe not you know uh mm -hmm. The Williams sisters, of course, the famous ten tennis players, went to Linwood High School. But you know, many years after uh, right. Al and I, um, I actually wish I would have known Al better when I was young. I would have uh, maybe he would have straightened me out. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait, I got to ask you: Do you still have your high school yearbook? Um, yeah, they're here somewhere, yeah. tucked away. You know, <laughs> do you know if Al signed your high school yearbook or wrote anything in it? I I don't I don't know. I'm going to have to look back and and see you know yeah that's a good question that's a very very good question yeah you also let us know that's great uh, like i said i didn't know i didn't know him that <laughs> yeah. well in high school so and of course the flip way around do you remember if you signed al's yearbook that i don't remember either he probably didn't ask me you know he just probably looked at me like i was some kind of hoodlum or something you know? <laughs> <laughs> so well, this guy's not touching my yearbook <laughs> And another uh, high school related question I got to ask, uh, do you ever go to your high school reunions? And if so, is uh, Al there as well? I don't think he's been to any of them and neither have I. I know we're always invited and it's not that I don't want to go. It's yeah. just that it's never really worked out. Yeah. You know, I've always, I was always out of town and, and, uh, and for Al, it would even be more difficult, you know, because he's, you know, he's such a, uh, you know, he's Al Yankovic. He's right. Weird Al. So, uh, <laughs> it's not that he wouldn't want to go either. He probably just, he's so busy. And, and uh, uh, they they stopped doing the reunion. They started doing uh, like Linwood picnics, you know, for certain years, you know, uh, that I almost went to one one year and I was out actually going to go. And and uh, in the last minute I got, you know, I had something to do. So unfortunately I haven't been back. Uh, I keep in touch with a lot of people from high school though. Mm -hmm. Quite a few Frank Sanchez, who you know, we've yeah. gotten back in oh, touch yeah. with each other recently. And Frank, uh, I think he was a senior when I was a freshman. But his brother Vince, uh, who was good friends with Al and even collaborated with him, as you know, uh, he was in, he played trumpet and band with me. Oh wow! So he was in my uh, my marching band trumpet oh, nice. section with me. And Frank could play a little bit of trumpet too, besides bass. And uh, so, so that's kind of how I know them. My my old girlfriend Susan McAllister, who was very good friends with Al, I, we keep in touch, you know, on a regular basis, and uh, it's kind of fun to, you know. And we just recently with uh, some of my old Linwood mates, we did a Zoom the other night. Some of the musicians. Oh, cool! But five or six of us, which was really fun. And my <laughs> my first trumpet teacher, who was my junior high band director, Ron Savitt, who uh, who knew of Al, of course, mm -hmm. as well. You know, that's so cool. <laughs> I'm curious to hear about, you know, what, what was Linwood like growing up? What are some of your memories? My parents moved to, uh, I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, and I'm the youngest of six. So my, my parents moved to Linwood in 1959 when I was one year old. And, uh, and Linwood was, uh, you know, I don't remember it back then. I just remember it as I grew up. Uh, Linwood kind of became kind of a rough town in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, after the first Watts riots, which were right next door to us, uh, you know, a lot of crazy stuff happened in Linwood too during that that time. Um, uh, one of the worst things that ever happened to Linwood, to, to, which was kind of its downfall, is when I was very young. My parents owned Linwood Hardware, um, and I'm sure Al's parents probably even shopped there sometime if they needed a nail or something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the 105 freeway that goes through uh, through town here. Uh, was supposed to come through when we were kids and it uh it got caught up in bureaucracy and at the state level and it didn't come through for many many years and, and what they had done is they bought out the whole downtown area of linwood which was basically a, kind of the financial district of our little town you know and my they bought my parents store and all the stores got closed down and the freeway didn't come through but they had boarded up all this housing along there and they opened it all up for low-income housing Okay, and it so it brought in it brought in a, a rougher element, you know, more of a struggle element, you know, 
Mm-hmm. And so the the town got rough, you know. It, uh, uh, I mean, we made it out alive, of course, but uh, uh, it was, you know, it it was it was an it was an okay place to be, but it was rough, and uh, mm. it toughened. I think it toughened us all up a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So after high school, when is the first time you connect with Al? Well, that's that's uh, that's a good question because you know I knew about. Uh, you know, all the things he was doing, of course, you know, and, and I was just doing other things, doing other studio work. And a very good friend of mine, his name is Warren Looning. You'll see his name on several of Al's things as a trumpet player. And Warren, uh, he's passed away now, unfortunately, was a very, dear, very dear friend of mine. And he, uh, a men- mentor as well, and fantastic trumpet player. I mean, played on over a thousand movies and, uh, and just a great player. And we got to be, he took a liking to me at one point, and he's one that kind of started recommending me for, uh, for some recording sessions, you know, to these contractors. Anyway, uh, I was doing a, a recording session with Warren in the uh, morning, and he had told me he was doing something with Weird Al that night. But Warren had just had hernia, uh, like he was getting over a hernia surgery, uh-huh. and he was really having a hard time playing that day on our session. Matter of fact, he was supposed to play principal trumpet, and he said, would you mind playing first trumpet today? He goes, my... And he showed me like his kids, he was all black and blue, you know, oh. in his, in his abdomen. Oh. Yeah. It was a, and he, it just hurt yeah. to play. So he didn't want to play anything high or hard. And he goes, I have this session with Al and sometimes he writes hard, you know? <laughs> and so he goes, can you do it tonight? I goes, goes, I'll tell you what, I'll meet you over at the studio and we can tell Al what's happening. And I go, well, I know him, you know, I haven't seen him in years. And so, uh, he came in and I said, Al, it's Wayne Bergeron. And we're like, oh my God, you know, and we, we kind of reconnected <laughs> at that point. And Warren told him what happened and said, you know, it'd be okay if Wayne did this tonight. And he goes, oh yeah, then no problem. Warren, go, go get better. So I, I did, we did Pokemon on that, uh, that session. And, uh, and so that kind of started my relationship working with him again. Um, there was a, the, the next session that came along was the, uh, uh the one on mandatory fun. I guess he called Warren for that, but Warren couldn't do it. So uh, he ended up calling me again. And so, and then unfortunately we lost Warren. So uh, the past couple of things Al's done, uh, I've got to do for him. Um, we did uh, we did the Hamilton polka thing. Did you ever hear that? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. Did he, I th- what did he do? Did you do that? Was that on Jimmy Fallon or was that on uh, one of the talk shows? He did that on because they loved Hamilton and he, he did it on that show. I think it was, was a Jimmy Fallon show. Yeah. They played a recording of it on, on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so we so we did that together. Uh, he brought me in to you know, put all the trumpet parts on that. And it was hilarious. I mean, when I was recording it, I was laughing. It was, just like, <laughs> it was silly because my daughter. I have a sixteen uh, year old daughter now, and at that time she was she was a Hamilton freak. So I knew the music to Hamilton. You know, yeah. I know this music. I'd heard okay, it. Yeah, every yeah. time my daughter was with me, it was on in the car. So when he, when he was doing, I was just busting up at the, the versions that he did of this, you know, and he he would go into swing, you know, <laughs> just it was so silly. And uh, but the th- interesting thing about Al, you know, he was never a writer as far as like sitting down with pen and paper and writing for an orchestra or writing for instruments. I don't think, you know, uh, he had some uh, you know musical ability, obviously, but he actually did very good uh, trumpet parts for me. Like everything was always correct and. The only things that might be extreme, like me, the, the ranges were a little extreme. He, I'd go, man, it might be a little high for, you know, what you're thinking this is supposed to sound like, you know, on the trumpet. Because hmm. on, a, on, a, on a keyboard, when he's demoing it, it might sound one way. But then you put the real instrument on, you go, wow, that's way too high for that instrument, you know. But uh, I have good high chops. That's kind of what I do anyway. But uh, so I, I just make some suggestions and go, hey, let's do it like this. This will sound better. And and uh, we would just plow through. He was always a pro and... And uh, and just a complete joy joy to work with, and kind of just fun to reconnect with him. My I, my daughter is a huge you know Weird Al fan too, so you know she never likes coming to work with me. I'd bring her to recording sessions sometimes and stuff, but she'd always just be bored to tears, you know. <laughs> but uh, I said, hey, uh, I, I said, hey, uh, you want to come to a session with me? Because oh, Dad, I go, well, it'll be fun. I, it won't be long, and I just uh. I just want you to meet somebody. So, oh, all right, whatever. So I get there <laughs> and it's just me overdubbing and, and Al, I'm the engineer in a small studio, you know? So I walk in and Al's at the board, but his hair is, is all, uh, it's in, it's in braids. Cause he was doing a TV show, like a medieval TV show at the time. I and actually, I played on it and I can't think of the name of it. Um, Oh, was it a Gallivant by any chance? Gallivant. Yeah. He was, so his yeah. hair was 
not his regular hair. So he's sitting at the board and my daughter doesn't realize it's him. Now I brought all Al's CDs and his books that my daughter has. And he turns around and she just lost her mind. <laughs> I mean, she was like, and all of a sudden I became the coolest dad ever you know, uh, from that, <laughs> from that point on. So he signed all her stuff and she's got some really great pictures with him. And then shortly after that, uh, he played with the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, who I was a, a member of at the time. So I asked him, hey, Al, how you doing? I'm playing with the orchestra tonight. And then I saw him at rehearsal. And and uh, I said, hey, my daughter's coming tonight. Would you mind? Can I get a couple of pictures signed you know, from you? And he goes, oh, no, it's no problem. So he... That night he, you know, he got her like a, you know, a, a backstage pass, of course, you know, but like a a list, an a lister backstage pass. And How so cool! She got to walk ahead to everybody in the line and walk right back, and he and he spent fifteen minutes with her, man, and and just, you know, he couldn't have been any any cooler uh, to taking that much time with my with my daughter, you know. And so anyway, he's a, he's a class act on on every level. Besides being just a, a mega talent, watching what he's had to learn to do what he does. I mean, he's had to learn how to sing for real. You know, when he first started, he wasn't a singer, you know, he just, he was kind of just doing these things to be funny. Right. And then as his fame carried on and he had to start singing, you know, uh, some of these things that are difficult to sing, he's started taking vocal lessons from what I understand and, you know, and have to have the endurance to get through one of his shows, you know, singing and energy wise. I mean, the guy's a ball of energy, you know, how he comes out, he comes, you know, comes out on a, Segway and he's running around the stage and costume changes. Yeah. I mean, and it's, that stuff is like it would kill a, kill an older man, you know. So uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing uh, entertainer. And, and that's the first time I'd actually seen his show was from the back, you know, wow. from the orchestra. Oh wow! And, and I was blown away how great it was. I was just blown away. Wow! How fun. Have you seen his show since uh, the, the Hollywood Bowl show? I, I haven't. Actually, we were planning on going to see uh, see him when he came back. He had a long tour. His last tour was really all over the place. And he was coming back here. And I can't remember. I might have even tried to get tickets and it was sold out. But then, you know, I figured, well, we'll catch him next time. And, uh, you know, and I don't know when that was. Maybe uh, oh, yeah, COVID yeah. hit yeah. and it was over, <laughs> you know. It was a, you know, it was a kind of a bad year last year. I don't know if you guys remember, but <laughs> <laughs> it was an especially bad year for me. And not to make this about me, but I, uh, uh, one week after we were, the, the uh, a, a global pandemic, I was uh, diagnosed with, uh, with cancer in my throat. Oh, no. Ooh. So all my work went away, you know, from COVID. COVID, and then I was diagnosed with cancer, and I was thinking, well, let's remind me not to play the lottery uh, oh, <laughs> right geez. now. Wow. I feel too lucky, you know. So I had a really bad wow. summer because I had to go through chemo and radiation and and things like that. But anyway, I got a clean bill of health in November. They uh, the treatments worked, and so oh, I'm, wow, I'm cool now. But I'm still kind of recovering, you know. And it's mainly because they were radiating my throat, so it wreaked havoc on my trumpet playing. But I'm I'm doing pretty darn well now. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that's all is good. And so hopefully, you know, when things get back uh, full bore here again, I can get back on the road and start doing some things. You know, uh, I just remembered, uh, I did hear from Al not too long ago, when all the stuff was going on in politics with Trump and Wayne County and all that stuff, you know, uh, Jimmy Fallon did a bit on his show where he started looking, trying to figure out what was going on in Wayne County, you know, Michigan uh, with Trump. And so he goes, I started Googling it and I put you know, uh, Trump. Then I put Wayne and, and my Wikipedia page came up on the TV show. <laughs> right. And, it said, oh, and all wow. I found was this, he goes, all I found was this jazz trumpet player, Wayne Bergeron. He goes, I, I always, you know, I always wanted to play jazz trumpet. So I thought, you know, well, I'll read about this guy a little bit. And so my phone, it was exploding that night with people telling me, Oh man, you were just on Jimmy Fallon. And I'm going, what wow. are you talking about? But, <laughs> wow. Al, but Al, Al sent me a really nice email and, uh, and he just said, my wife and I, we fell out of our chairs, you know, <laughs> we were watching, you know, so that's the last time I talked to him, uh, wow. was, uh, was then whenever that email came in and hopefully I'll get wow. to do something with him again in the future, you know? Yeah. And, and just back to the cancer of all places for you to get cancer, a trumpet player getting in throat cancer. That is just, that's horrible. So. Oh, it's yeah, it was really actually at the base of my tongue, in my throat, though, but it was outward growing, so I had a lump in the side of my neck. And, oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, it, it was not fun. Uh, and, you know, I thought it was going to be career-ending, because if I needed surgery, it was going to probably, most likely, end my career. Maybe not, you know, but you never you never know. You're gonna get, They start cutting in, you're cutting your lymph right. nodes out. Right, right. It does a lot of damage. I mean, the, the radiation alone, 
you know, did some damage and kind of wreaked havoc on my uh, saliva glands, mm-hmm. um, which have mm-hmm. recovered somewhat. But at night, it's I'm really dried out. You know, I have to sip water. You know, I wake up every couple hours mm-hmm. and have to sip water. And that's just going to probably be my reality. But during the day, it's pretty good. And, and I got to say, I feel I feel pretty normal. I mean, I'm, my strength is back. My uh, my playing is definitely way, way better. I mean, I made like leaps and strides, you know, uh, from where I was because uh, it hurt yeah. so bad to play, you know, as you can imagine. And uh, and other than the saliva thing, I'm 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 doing pretty good. I don't want I don't want to jinx it. I feel very fortunate, <laughs> you know, that I've gotten gotten oh, yeah. on the other side of this thing. Man, and and uh you know, and I'm still here to talk about it. Um, fortunately, it's a very, very curable cancer. It's HPV P16 positive squamous cell carcinoma. And I know more about this crap than I ever wanted to know <laughs> now, you know. Oh, geez. You know, when oh. you hear about somebody with cancer, you go, oh, you, know, you don't even know what it was. But when it happens to you, you learn every little single mm. thing about it. You know, so I was reading and and how they're going to treat it. And, and the doctor told me, he said, well, this is, uh, goes, the good news is, 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 you know, this is the cancer to get if you're going to get cancer, you know? <laughs> He said, it's, we, we know a lot <laughs> about way to it, put he it. said. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, he goes, we know a lot about it, and we have a very, there's a very high success rate with this, you know. So it was in the 90, 90%, you know, success rate. So, yeah. and, and very slim chances of it coming back, you know, uh, which was, is good. news. it doesn't mean it can't. It just, the chances right. are a- against it. But then he told me, he goes, uh, but untreated, it will kill you uh, quickly, fairly quickly. And uh, he said, so if you're thinking about not treating it, um, he said, but also there's no worse treatment <laughs> you can go through, you know, because they're, they're radiating your neck. You know, if you're getting, you know, if you've got prostate cancer or something, they might radiate that area, but you don't feel it. Right. You know, right. when they're radiating uh. the area, you know, where all your sensory, your taste buds and your saliva glands and, you know, all these, all these things are happening there that you feel, you know, when the side effects start kicking in. So it was rough. It was like swallowing glass in my throat, you know, through this. Oh. Fortunately, most people get a feeding tube and I managed to avoid that because I just was going, no, I'm, we're not doing a feeding tube. I'm going to like, I don't care if I got to, wow. you know, drink smoothies for the rest of my life. I don't care, you know? So, uh, but anyway, I got, I was able to eat and I powered through it and, uh, and yeah, so here we are, you know, knock on wood. I think this is wood. Hear that. <laughs> well, we are really glad to hear that, you know, you, you have a clean bill of health and that, what, what a thing to go through. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, you, you, when it happened, you know, you, it's weird. You think, why me? You know? And as I started going through it, I go, well, you know, why not me? It's, you know, it doesn't pick and choose. I, I just lost a very dear friend, a 43 old saxophone player to a very rare cancer that they didn't even know how to treat really. And he just passed away, you know, and it was a heart, heartbreaking 43 years old and, it doesn't care, man. Cancer just it just lands where it lands, and and uh, I learned a lot from it though. And being on the other side of it, it's made me, um, for lack of a better term, less of an asshole. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I've lo- I've lo- might have lost a little bit of my edge, you know, and I, I, I cry a little. I cry a little easier, right. and I think about the important things in life more now. And I'm giving it a second chance here, so I'm not going to blow it, you know. So yeah. It changes really for put, sure. Yeah, it really puts things in perspective. Thanks for sharing that story with us, Wayne. I'm curious, a, as a high school classmate of Alfred Yankovic, when is it that you finally realize, wait, this is not just my high school classmate, Alfred. This is Weird Al. This is somebody who's gone beyond high school and, and, and reached a, a, a level of celebrity. When was that moment for you? Um, it was probably shortly after high school because he really started, you know, all of a sudden he's coming and you know, and you think doing something like that's not going to have any longevity, you know, of course you would think, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a novel thing and he was really great at it, but man, he, this guy, it just never stopped, you know? And I, I heard his name just, you know, constantly since then. And he's gone on to do so many other things, you know, you know with, when they animate you, you know, you've made it. <laughs> <laughs> the cartoon of you, you're in, you're, you you've made it. <laughs> so, I mean, really, I'm just really impressed with his uh, the production of everything he does, too. You know, he, to a T, like when he's, you know, when he's doing a parody of a tune, he, every detail about that tune, about how it's recorded, about the guitar sound, about, you know, the reverb that's used on things. I mean, he's really, really, really dove deep into studying exactly, so it'll sound exactly like the thing, but with his special <laughs> sauce on it. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I realized, you know, this guy has made it uh, you know, shortly after high school. 
but I didn't realize that he would have the longevity he's had, you know? Yeah. Uh, because it's kind of un- in, in the business, especially things that are kind of novelty like that to have them, but he's so good at it. And other people have done it obviously as well, you know, but they're fallen by the wayside where Al keeps reinventing himself. And uh, it seems like he has his finger on the pulse of what will work. Yeah. You know, uh, and it's not, uh, it's not so obvious. Like his things aren't as obvious as some, some other things, you know, you know, he's, 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 he's brilliant, you know, and even his original music, yeah. you know, like Albuquerque, you know, I, I think that's just one of the funniest things I've ever heard. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great tune, man. And it, it sounds great. And he sounds, you think he sounds great on it. You know, so when my daughter and I would listen to that in the car, I'd go, I'd actually like to see if it wasn't funny, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Produced really well. And, and uh, right. And, and, so yeah, so I'm, I'm you know besides a an ex schoolmate and uh, and a side man of his in the studios at least you know I'm a I'm a fan. I guess you had no inkling that you know 35 years later after your high school graduation you would be recording with Alfred you know on his number one album Mandatory Fun. No, I did not. You know, you know he was doing when we walked in the studio they were uh, they were doing tacky. You know? Yeah, cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so my daughter got to hear a little bit about that. And then Al told her, he goes, now look, this is all top secret. You can't tell anybody you heard this. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be released for a few months, you know. And she goes, I promise, I promise I won't say anything, you know. And I go, <laughs> got to keep that promise, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was very good. Did your daughter keep that promise? Oh, uh, yeah, she did. She did. <laughs> okay, that's <very> good. <laughs> yeah, because I told her I'd have to, you know. We'd have to silence her, you know. We don't, we don't want to do all sending his goons. <laughs> but Wayne, at what point do you go from playing trumpet for fun to playing trumpet professionally? Um, I'm not sure. When you say professionally, I always think, well, what was the first time I made money? <laughs> right. <laughs> it would be in the ninth grade. I played in a, a band at my uh, when I was a freshman. There was a band of seniors called Synopsis that played, you know, the top 40 music of the day. And I ended up getting into that band with them because they needed a trumpet player. So I came in. I remember doing my first paid gig was at the Linwood Bowling Alley. And we played five hours. Wow. And I made $20. <laughs> wow. And at the end of the night, I went, damn, I just made $20 playing the trumpet. <laughs> you know, I was like, this, this is what I want to do, you know. And so. With that band played once in a while, and we made a few bucks. Then I got in this other band when I was in the 10th grade in East, in East L.A. It was a band called City. It was a band that played weddings and stuff. And I was in another little community band with uh, this trombone player that was a few years older than me. And he said, I'm in this band City, and we need a trumpet player. Would you be interested? And I'm going, yeah, of course. So I, I got into this band, and this band worked every weekend. And they did a couple of weddings a weekend and made like 75 bucks a gig. You know, this is 1974, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and I'm just a kid and making 150 bucks playing my horn on the weekends. My That's mom great. had to drive me to the gigs because I was only 15, <laughs> you know. But uh, I knew that I knew then that this is kind of what I wanted to do. Now, as I got older and got through school and uh, out of high school, the, the music business wasn't exactly beating my door down. Going, oh God, we have to have Wayne Bergeron. You know, it wasn't that wasn't happening. So I I ended up taking a day job. I worked at McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. I still played, you know, but on the side, but I didn't take the trumpet very seriously. It wasn't until later that I, I decided I'm going to put some time in on the horn and really dial this in. I had, I mean, I had quite a bit of natural ability in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, when I got into the real world, uh, it was kind of a rude awakening for me. And I wasn't really prepared and nor was I trained to how to be prepared for that. So, uh, you know, maybe I was let down a little bit by my, my, uh, my teachers <laughs> yeah. possibly you know but you know i don't blame them it all worked out okay you know my path worked out great so i'm uh, i have no regrets about anything but uh i've known since i was very young this is what i wanted to do and i didn't know i was going to be doing studio work you know i just figured i always wanted to be in a band you know like a rock band like chicago or yeah and go on the road and you know do that i wanted to be a rock star trumpet player you know uh, which there's very few of <laughs> So, but, but that's kind of where my passion was. I liked that kind of music, you know, uh, pop music or soul music. You know, I loved Tower of Power and Blood, Sweat and Tears and, uh, and Malo and, you know, bands like that and War. I was kind of really into that music and the band I played in East LA, we played all that stuff. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of what I always wanted to do, but, uh, you know, you don't really get to, you know, we all try to carve our path in life and, uh, you know, life 
carves it for us sometimes says no nope, you're not doing that you're going to do this and you meet somebody else and you or you meet a girl or whatever you know and you get married and things change and you know and it steers you down however i ended up here i'm i'm you know I'm in the happiest place i am my entire life right now you know i wouldn't be here if anything would have been different so uh you know i uh, i always tell students that i go you can go ahead and plan away all you want <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going to go to college, you're going to get your music degree, you're going to do this and you're going to do this. And then you're going to find out that it doesn't all quite fall into place that, that easily, you know, uh, you gotta be, you gotta be flexible and you gotta be ready to roll with the punches and go another, go another path to get to the same place you might have to do, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that's kind of how it was for me, you know? And at what point are you recording with people like Green Day and Katy Perry and Neil Diamond and Pat Boone? You know, when does that happen? Well, they were, they were all far apart. Katy Perry was more recently, of course. That was well, yeah. maybe just a couple of years ago. Uh, Pat Boone, I did this funny record that he did this album and it was all swing music. He was doing like Stairway to Heaven and tunes like that, all <laughs> swing. And it was really funny because his, the church like was really down on him about that. <laughs> album because on the front of it he's in leather and he's got fake tattoos on it's pat boone for god's sake it's the hoffy <laughs> hot dog guy you know, right for old, those of us that are old enough to know about him doing those commercials with white patent leather shoes right you know so uh for him to do that was really, but it's a really a great album musically because he had all these incredible arrangers and this incredible band uh but those are that was a quite that was 20 years ago maybe no something like that yeah. green day was uh you know after after that uh, and interesting working with people like Green Days. You'll come in and with bands like that, not them necessarily, but I did a, I've done a couple of recordings uh, with bands where they come in and there's no music oh. and they just want to <laughs> sing stuff. They sing stuff. They've got six horn players and they're singing us stuff. And I'm going, uh, okay, well, but you know, kind of grab a piece of music paper. All right, let's jot this lick down. Okay, let's harmonize. And then we kind of just do it, you know, and those things, even though they're frustrating to do like that. Sometimes at the end product, you go, man, that sounds pretty darn good. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of it all being preconceived. So um, all those things you mentioned are very different types of sessions, too. You know, sometimes it's just a horn section over to Pat Boone. We all recorded together. You know, the Green Day was just a horn section over to uh, movies and stuff like that. We're generally together. You know, the orchestra's in one room and we're... We're, we're doing everything together. You performed on a lot of really great and a diverse number of movies. I wanted to hit on two that Al also is featured on the soundtracks of, and that is George of the Jungle and Spy Hard. Yeah, that's right. Spy Hard, because he sings on there. That's right. He sings the tune Spy Hard. I forgot about that. Yeah. That was a, that was yeah. a while ago, too. So that movie is, that's probably at least 15 years ago, I would think. Um, but I didn't see Al. I didn't even know he was going to be part of it because when we're in there, we're doing the underscore, of course. Right. You know, and uh, and so when I finally saw the movie, then I saw that he was, in, you know, singing in the end credits. <laughs> uh, it was pretty, pretty funny. And I go, all right, that's my buddy. <laughs> we're working together. We didn't, even, we, didn't, we didn't even know it, you know. Um, funny movie too. Yeah. If I remember correctly, you know, and then what was it? The other one was, uh, George of the jungle. Al had a, his George song, of the jungle, his yeah. cover of George of the jungle on the soundtrack. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. I wish I would, uh, you know, I would have loved to have been playing with Al earlier. I'm glad he found Warren Looning, you know, who was my mentor mm -hmm. that played on, he played on a lot of things with Al. And then as well as, uh, if you look at the, at Al's CDs, you'll see a name, Joel Peskin on there playing clarinet. Right. Yeah, and and uh, Jim Self playing tuba, and those are players or colleagues of mine that I I st still work with, um, and they played on almost all of his stuff when he was doing this. Wow. And they're they're great studio oh, nice. musicians. They kind of do what I do, and they you know they uh, we play on soundtracks and commercials and you know other recording projects and things like that. So Wayne, how did you get involved with the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra? Uh, well, Warren Looning, the name I mentioned. Uh, the orchestra you know, changed a bit over the years, but he became the principal trumpet player in that group. And so as principal trumpet player, he could designate his list of substitutes hmm. or extras if we needed somebody. Like if he felt like he needed me to, uh, like they did a Big Earth Wind a Fire concert and, uh, and you know, really challenging high stuff. He goes, well, we got to bring Wayne in for this. So, so he put me on the top of the list. So I, I wasn't actually ever a, an official member of the orchestra. Um, hmm. but I was there almost every concert on some capacity. And then when porn passed away, I did two seasons as the principal trumpet player, but I wasn't officially the trumpet player. And then they had an audition. They had to have a, an official audition for the chair. 
and uh and i couldn't make the audition oh jeez. Oh. <laughs> so so they put me in the finals anyway and and uh, uh but they selected the other uh the other trumpet player's name is rob Shear, who actually actually took a couple of lessons from me when he was young wow <laughs> <laughs> he's a great great trumpet player i mean fantastic player and he's one of the top call players here now and and good good very good friend yeah. of mine as well and uh and he won the job actually and and uh and oh, we have this ongoing joke because I don't care. You know, I'm happy that they've selected him. He did the audition. He should have. He should have the chair. Yeah. You know, but he's but he's like Warren, so he has me there too. So nothing's really changed. <laughs> you know, I I still you know up until the pandemic I was still doing you know playing in the orchestra on most of the concerts. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's really a fun, uh, you know, it's it's a fun group to play with because you, there's a big variety of music we get to do. We back acts and we get to do feature concerts. And we do film music and. We get to play two picture where they'll show a movie and we play the soundtrack and do stuff like that, which is really quite fun to do. Yeah, it sounds and, uh, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and from my youth, I remember playing at the Hollywood Bowl Battle of the Bands when I was a kid in high school. And I always remember that stage rotating, man, and seeing that the, the enormity of that place with the 18,000 seats. And, and to this day when I'm there, I flash back on the first time I was there when I was a kid. I still have that same <laughs> feeling of excitement when I get on that stage. And uh, so it's pretty neat. And I played there a bunch of times for different things, of course, with the Philharmonic and and uh, and other things, you know, that have gone on there. But uh, it's a it's a great venue. It's one of the greatest venues I've ever, ever played at. Yeah, I was in attendance for both of the uh, Hollywood Bowl shows that Weird Al performed back in 2016. And it was the first time I had ever been there. And the venue there was amazing. I could not believe how big it was. And I could not believe how great it sounded. It was it was a great experience. You know? Yeah, they've, they've, they've dialed the sound in there finally. It used to not be good years ago. But now they've got it uh, so... They've got the speaker's time, so people watching the video, everything's in sync now, even in the right. cheap seats, hmm. you know. So so that was 2016, then, that concert was. That was a mandatory fun tour, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was the mandatory world tour, yep, back in uh, July 2016. Yep, July 22nd and July 23rd. All right, yeah, so five years ago almost. Okay. And it doesn't seem that long to me. It just, you know, time is <laughs> like zooming by here, you know, so. And I wanted to point out that one of the songs that Weird Al performed with the orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl show was Now That's What I Call Polka, which you mm -hmm. had performed on in the studio. What was that experience like performing a song that you had recorded back in the studio on on stage at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, it was because I remembered that. I go, oh, I played on this, you know, but the parts <laughs> were all different because oh, okay. what I played on, he just wrote like, he just wrote two trumpet parts, a clarinet part and a tuba part. And then the clarinet might be doubled and have two parts as well, you know, so it would sound like a little mini band, like a real polka band. And so, but then they expanded it out for full orchestra. So uh, the parts were quite different from what I had originally played. <laughs> uh, but it made me crack up. I was going, I remember, because I remember it was Al, in Al's, you know, he was kind of what the little program, the program he used wasn't like this even state of the art. It was something like a little funky, you know, I can't remember what he was using, but uh, it was quantized in an inter interesting way where uh, like sometimes these programs, if you play things in with the keyboard, it'll print them out correctly, but not the most uh, practical way to read it. Like the rhythms look funny, if you know what I mean. Hmm. Uh it's like, uh, like if you have a rhythm that goes like, uh, pop, 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 right? Like I would write that as four eighth notes and a quarter note, like one and two and three, right? But he wanted them really short. So instead of writing eighth notes with dots over the top of them, wouldn't make them short, he'd write 16th notes to make sure they were really short, right? So, but then uh -huh. they'd have 16th rests between them. And so all of a sudden it looks more complicated. You know, it, it makes it, even though it's just dot, 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 it looks like a math project kind of, you go, oh, oh, oh that's all that is. Okay. So, uh, so the parts we had for the Holly Bowl Orchestra, actually the orchestrator had taken everything and, and, uh, it had it written out perfectly, you know, Cool. but Al, it's interesting because watching him, the parts he would actually write would be very good, you know, so for not, you know, somebody that probably never studied orchestration, um, he had, he just got a natural kind of talent and ability for uh knowing what something's gonna sound like and uh and, and he'd have me experiment a lot so a lot of those things on the polkas where you hear that offbeats going wah, 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 it would sound like a duck kind of you know so yeah. he'd have me he'd have we i don't have my horns out or i'd demonstrate one now but but he would have me bring all my mutes 
And so I have a collection of like vintage mutes and, <laughs> and I have all kinds of different things to make different sounds. And so he'd have me experiment. He goes, let's try it on this one. He goes, oh, that's the one right there. Let's do that. He goes, now let's do the same thing, but let's do it with this mute and we'll do them together. And he goes, and I'll pan them left and right. So you'd hear, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and you'd hear these funny things. <laughs> and, if you, and if you listen to the production of some of those things, there's a lot going on. There's more more to meets the ear than exactly what's going on. It's all this little <laughs> detail. And, uh, and he was really particular about it. I mean, it wasn't just like, you know, I could just phone in and go, there you go. That's what you want, right? No, you're not, and he was very specific about making sure that we're in time, you know, because when you're going, when, when you use a mute that goes wah, like wah, 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 you know, it can sound late because it goes wah. So you have to make wah on the beat. And it's kind of difficult to do. It's hard to explain if you're not a trumpet player. <laughs> but uh, so to play fast notes, go wah, 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 is sounds easy enough but it's really hard and he'd have stuff like that all over the place you know and so it was yeah. actually actually quite fun you know now we, we've mentioned like a, a lot of people you've performed with and i'm just going to throw a few more names out there for this next question but you know you've performed with people like neil diamond and, and lady gaga and michael buble and kenny g and adam sandler and david hasselhoff like all these amazing people but when you're performing with al this guy who you went to high school with is there something just surreal about that yeah i was proud man i you know, went at rehearsal because I knew he was going to see me back there, you know, and I, I he's going to go, hey, Wayne, you're going to come over and give me a hug. And <laughs> so this in front of, you know, 70 piece orchestra. So it's fun when you know the artist. And there's been a couple of times that's, you know, happened. So uh, but with him up there, I went up and, you know, and gave me a big hug and, you know, made a big deal about me and. You know, goes we went to high school together. You know, and and I, you know, I was very, I was very proud to, you know, <laughs> proud of him and proud to, proud to be there, and and uh, and I thought it was very, very cool. So that was how I felt about it. He probably didn't give a damn, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was he's a pretty pretty cool guy, man. He's he's a uh, salt of the earth, man. And and I felt like no time had passed at all. I felt like I still know who he is, you know. Or, you know, we were at the Grammys the year I was nominated. One of his projects was nominated as well. And that was 2004, I think. And I, what's, what, I wonder what that one would have been um, of his. That's a long time ago now. But uh, we sat together at the Grammys at Staples Center. Oh, wow. My, uh, my, oh, ex-wife, cool. my, ex, my ex-wife and I and him. And uh, so it was pretty fun. And then when we went to, you know, when you get nominated for a Grammy, you get to go... Uh, you get to go to all the part these little parties they have like the week before. There's all kinds of little shindigs and mm-hmm. and uh, you know there was a jazz party I went to and and uh, it was really fun. So my ex and I and my daughter Ella, who wasn't born yet, uh, my ex was pregnant with her at the time, and uh, so anyway, it's kind of a I always remember that memory because my daughter was almost born. It was just before June first. Uh, or a couple of months before she was born when that was happening. But we sat mm-hmm. with Al there and and laughed. And, uh, you know, he didn't win that year, but uh, it was awesome. It was awesome to sit there. It was another proud moment. I'm going, hey, I'm nominated for a Grammy. So was Al. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so it was a kind of a big deal. Oh, you might be mistaken, Wayne. Um, Al actually did win in 2004 for Best Comedy Album for Poodle Hat. Oh, maybe he did. Yeah. I, I, I forgot what had happened to that year, actually. <laughs> uh, my, my band uh, was my first CD, and, and uh, called, it's called You Called Us a Living. And uh, we were nominated for Best Large Ensemble, but we didn't really have a prayer. You know, when, when it got nominated, um, one of the uh, board members, a friend of mine, Greg Field, who's a big producer now he was with Concord records for a long time and produced a lot of great things. He called me from New York. He goes, dude, are you sitting down? And I go, yeah, it was early in the morning. It was like 7am in LA. And he was there. <laughs> he goes, your, your CD got nominated for a gram. I'm like, really? Oh, I, I forgot we'd even submitted the stuff. <laughs> you know, I just wow. We'd submit. I really didn't have any thought. I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about it. You know, it's like, you know, you don't do a project to win a Grammy. You do a project cause you want to, do a good project right you know right and if it happens to get some accolades that's great you know and it gives it a little bit of traction so after i hung up i thought about it, i go damn real, wow you know and then the competition i was up against was so fierce it was major major name uh people you know michael brecker who's a very famous saxophone player that we've lost and he had this uh he had this large ensemble he would usually not be in that category but he had this large ensemble cd that he did that year and it was legendary. I mean, it had to win. <laughs> you know, there's, 
you know, and then I was up against my, my friend Gordon Goodwin, who I play in his band, and I played on his CD as well. We were up against each other in that category as <laughs> <Wow>. well. <laughs> and, wow. and so at, at the pre-show that happens in the afternoon for these kind of things, for classical music and jazz, it happens in the afternoon. And then all the pop acts and things happen at night at Staples yeah. Center. We sat yeah. together, and, uh, and I was really nervous. I was more nervous about, you're right, Al did win, because I remember him, his speech now. I, I, now I remember. He did win that year, because he was really funny as, a, as his, for, uh, his acceptance speech. <laughs> so I was nervous. I go, man, if I win this thing, I got to go up there and talk. After like all these, you know, somebody like Al who's extremely witty and, and I'm going to be terrified. You know, I was, I was as nervous as a hooker, hooker in church, you know. <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, please don't let me win. Please don't let me win. I think I just did. <laughs> but I had my little Grammy speech written and I was, I was ready to go. Just in case. Know. And, uh, That's right. And, uh, so anyway, and then, you know, I did my next CD because of that. Concord Records actually picked up my next CD and funded it. Wow. You know, so, so Grammy nomination oh. can, you know, it can get you some stuff, you know, so, uh, Hal Gaba from Concord Records was kind enough to do the next. So it was done full on, you know, I had a bunch of great charts done. Better CD, in my opinion, than the first one. I'd grown as a musician. And so I had a publicist behind me. I have this whole team. I have a record label now. Nothing with the Grammys. <laughs> <Not a. laughs> you know, and then I did one uh, a few years ago and nothing as well. It got a lot of accolades, that one. Uh, but uh and some really great reviews, but you know, it's a, it's a kind of a name recognition thing too. You know, I, I'm a side man, you know, I'm a studio player and I'm a behind the scenes player. And, and I did these CDs, uh, just to generate another side of me so I could go do master classes and teach and, and be a guest artist with like college jazz bands and things like that, which I do a lot of. So that's, hmm. was my original plan for doing these. So I'd have a calling card. Oh, very cool. And, uh, it kind of spun into this other thing where they, the, the CDs got a little bit successful, you know? And that's in the jazz market, which kind of means nothing. But, you know, the jazz market has like, you know, 4% of the entire music market. So if you sell 10,000 records or CDs or, or bits now, you know, nobody even likes CDs anymore. Um, if you sell 10,000, you know, as a jazz artist, you're doing very, very well. If you send 10, you know, in the pop world, that's your complete flop and you're going right. to never sign you. <laughs> right. So that's yeah. kind of the difference, you know, it's, it's, it's millions versus, you know, 10,000. One thing I found really interesting is, you know, one film that has really kind of highlighted trumpet playing is La La Land. And you were a trumpet soloist for that film. I was. Yeah. That, uh, I didn't even know what that was when we went in to record the movie. I didn't know it was a movie. It was La La Land. They said it was a show. And I'm going, oh, is this kind of Broadway? It was just weird the way we, re we recorded all the jazz stuff first, mm -hmm. like the smaller group things, you know. And uh, and we kind of played through them, and we didn't spend much time on them. There was some mistakes and some, you know, some things like they're going, oh, it's fine. It's fine. Let's move on. Next tune. <laughs> and then they ended up using just bits and pieces of those things. That's why it was just fine. They're going, we're not even going to get this far, you know. And in, in the movie, we're only using it for like a five-second thing. and. Mm. Or whatever. So, uh, but then the movie came out, and you know, I did the underscore as well with the orchestra, and uh, and it became this, you know, this huge thing. Uh, you know, there's these different trumpet players, like what we call sidelining. That's where they're up on the trumpet players you see on the screen. They have the music to what I played in front of them, and they're wearing a little earphone, or they can hear it on speakers. They hear the music, and they're playing along with my parts, so it looks like they're playing. Right, right. You know, so that's called sidelining in the in the uh, in the in, uh, in the musician business here. And so a lot of people would think that it was those players playing. <laughs> they go, "No, you're not, Wayne Bergeron didn't play that." You know, I saw <laughs> Bijan Watson and uh, Javier Gonzalez, who are both great, great trumpet players, but they just happened to, you know. They were picked uh, for this thing for their look, you know. They could have both done a great job, you know, if they'd actually played on it as well, you know. But, but uh, so yeah, it was fun. And that thing has turned out to be somewhat of a cash cow for me. Oh, <laughs> in sure. many ways, uh, <laughs> because yeah. because uh, not just because of residuals, which has been a little bit of that, not not as much as you might think, but as a side man anyway. But uh, with the with the new trend now of doing uh, like doing things live like showing a movie and then having an orchestra play the score live you know and they do it at the hollywood bowl like mm -hmm. i did a big pixar show with the cleveland orchestra like that where they show the movies and you play the music the orchestra plays the music to them and it, it's really kind of a cool way to see a movie and you got live music so they started doing a la la land live tour and so they would go to these different orchestras and they would rehearse for a couple of days and then they would do a couple of nights you know and they went all over the world 
Well, we went over, they decided in Korea, they wanted to actually bring Justin Hurwitz, the composer, to conduct, and the and the jazz band out to play with this Korean orchestra. Wow. Great Korean National Symphony. So we went out there, the whole band, and, and uh, it was really fun. I mean, it was, you know, it was really great to do that. And we, we did like four concerts there, and then we... We went. Uh, we went there twice, actually. And then we did. Uh, we went to Taiwan twice uh, to do this. And then I've gone on. They brought just me a couple of times. I played with the Dallas Symphony, and then I did a to uh, tour with the Tokyo Philharmonic, doing all this. Uh, wow. Think, well, we better bring the trumpet parts are hard. We better, let's bring the trumpet player out to play it on it, you know. So uh, it's really turned out to, to to give me quite a few nice gigs, you know, and uh, and there was more on the books actually, but because of COVID, you know, that all went away, of course. Well, just an incredible career. I mean, just to briefly mention a couple of these amazing movies, Catch Me If You Can, you've uh, performed for Star Wars, Star Trek, Beverly Hills Chihuahua, that masterpiece you were on. Yeah, um, I, I was I, I was a voice. <laughs> I was the voice of one of the uh, Chihuahuas, no or one of the dogs, you know, because they had, <laughs> yeah. they had different trumpet players on that show. There was a guy named Jose Hernandez, who's a mariachi trumpet player here, very famous from around here, great, great trumpet player. And they wanted this to be very authentic, so uh, the bulk of the solos are him for the main Chihuahua character. And then the German <laughs> Shepherd was me, I think. I'd have little solos, these little kind of solos when the German Shepherd character was there. And and uh, it was it was actually very fun. You know, another movie uh, that's very trumpet heavy that I'm very you know honored to be associated with are both of the Incredibles movies, or very uh, trumpet heavy wow. movies, and and uh, yeah. and they're a little more recent. Uh, you know, the last one anyway. Uh, but my daughter, my daughter, well, that was right around the time of uh, the Grammys because my daughter wasn't quite born yet when that first movie uh, mm -hmm. was coming out. I remember. Uh, and I had appendicitis. I had my appendix taken out a week before I recorded that. So no my, I was in pain <laughs> and I had, was wearing a weight belt, you know, to, to hold my abdomen in while I was playing. And I had to play all this really hard, high, ferocious stuff. Oh. <laughs> it was, it was a, it's a memory I'd like to forget, you know, but, <laughs> but it was kind of, kind of painful. Um, but those movies, both those movies are ch very trumpet heavy movies where most of the things I work on, you know. Uh, some of the other things you, you mentioned, you know, uh, not so much. The Star Trek thing you mentioned, I, I was a sub on some of the Star Trek shows like uh, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and some of those things. I wasn't a regular. But we got to recreate the original Star Trek theme. I don't know if you've seen they did the recreation of this whole thing where they've recolorized uh, this stuff and then they re-recorded the theme, actually. Wow. And so I got to that, which was really cool to get to do to sit down and play that original music and re-record it for this thing, you know. And I don't, I, I don't know. I've heard it, but I don't know what, what package set it's, 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 it's in. But it's, uh, they recolorized a bunch of things, and you know, they make the things look better, and everything sounds better than because the technology is better now, you know. So that was really a cool thing to be involved with. I have to say, one of those a proud, proud moments, you know. How cool. You also recorded on some really amazing TV shows. Some of my favorites, like South Park and, and The Simpsons and American Dad and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and King of the Hill. But you're also involved in Jeopardy. Well, I was uh, for several years. They've changed, you know, they change themes, you know, yeah, like the weather sometime. <laughs> uh, the only one that's been really had longevity for me has been the America's Funniest Home Videos theme because that was from 2003. And I've done all the versions uh, on that show to date. Wow. Oh, wow. But Jeopardy ran, my version ran for uh, a good eight or nine years, I think, uh, with the, the think music, you know, being, uh, you know, being the little trumpet thing in the middle, being <laughs> ba -dee -da 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 -dee -da on the trumpet, you know, when they're doing the think music. That's so um, cool. <laughs> so my mother, that was like her proudest thing of me, you know, with all this cool stuff I've gotten to do. She go, you know, my son, he played on Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> that was like her, her thing. And so even when she was in this this rest home, uh, and I would be there and I'd be there visiting her, and you know Jeopardy would come on at seven o'clock or whatever, and uh, and she go, well, you better get going. You got to go to work. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, Jeopardy's going to be on at seven o'clock. She, like, she didn't realize that that I didn't go there every night. And right. Stand backstage and play this thing. You know, they go, go, Wayne. Play. Oh wow. <laughs> was, she didn't quite understand the pre-recorded concept of all that. You know, which was uh, I thought was funny. <laughs> <laughs> that was my mom. She was she was hilarious. Oh, that's man. priceless! Wow. <laughs> yeah. So uh, some of those older ones, King of the Hill, those are all in syndication now and things. I only worked on this. I worked on The Simpsons more recently with the new versions of it. The music's different now, 
Um, but I played in, in the original orchestra a few times. I was kind of a substitute occasionally. You know, they had their regular players that do these things. Mm-hmm. I've been doing Family Guy for 10 years as a regular now. Cool. Uh, and, and American Dad, where originally I wasn't on those shows. I was a sub or a fill-in, you know, and then eventually things change. And um, more current shows uh, or like Mickey Mouse works, you know, uh, or things that we're doing now. Animaniacs Reboot, which oh, we've yeah. been doing now, which is really, really, really cool. Um, that's been a blast. And we're doing this uh, Dr. Seuss, uh, Green Eggs and Ham, that uh, David Newman's doing the music on. And in the pandemic, we've been doing all of those from home studios, which is a kind oh. of a cha- weird <laughs> challenge, but uh, we're, we're making it work. And uh, we're back in the studios a little bit now with smaller groups. We've, we've gone back and done a couple of family guys as a group, and we have to be social distance. We have to get COVID tests. It's really a, it's really a high, it's a, quite an ordeal to put one of these together when you think about the, yeah, the testing and all the stuff that has to happen and organization of all that. It's a, I have a movie I'm doing on Monday, um, and I have to get a COVID test on Sunday for that. Um, wow. So it's going to, anyway, at least we're getting back together again, which is good. And I got my first COVID jab the other day too. So I get my next one on April, April 1st. Uh, I'm not 65 yet, but uh, because I'm an educator, uh, I'm on staff at Cal State Northridge. Oh, yeah. But now educators are in line. So I just turned 63. So, and Al is 61, I think now. Is Al 60 or 61? He's 61. Yeah, yeah. Because he's a, uh, you know, he was a kid. He's, yeah, I'm two years older than him, but it's because he was just so much smarter than everybody he graduated, you know. <laughs> way early and yeah he'll be 62 yeah, this year yeah okay i hate him for that <laughs> <laughs> on your website waynebergeron.com you actually have mouthpieces that you had a part in creating or inventing can you tell us a little bit about that uh, yeah i have my own uh you know trumpet players if you know anything about trump players we're always looking for the magic mouthpiece you know, we're all a little bit different and mouthpieces come in all shapes and sizes and cup depths and rim sizes and based on the size of your face and your teeth and all that stuff, they're all kind of different factors and changing the sound and everybody likes something different. Well, this particular thing that we came up with for me, I kind of hit a home run for me, of course, and uh, decided to market them. Well, lo and behold, it turned into a, another side business and they become extremely popular and I can't keep the things in stock. So now, is it the perfect mouthpiece? Of course it is. <laughs> um, I have to, that's an advertising pitch right there. Of course it is. No, it's a, uh, but it's, it's been very successful. And uh, so I came out with a line. I designed a few different versions of it and uh, with a guy named Gary Ratke of GR Technologies. And uh, he's outside, of, in, he's in Deuceman, Wisconsin. And he's outside of Milwaukee. And he's a kind of a brainiac, savant, uh, acoust- uh, acoustical genius. And uh, anyway, he designed them and makes them, and uh, and so he makes them for me, and I uh, I'm I'm the dealer, so I buy them from him, and I and I sell them, and uh, it's been it's been something you know I didn't think it was going to be a big deal. Now we've sold over fifteen hundred mouthpieces. Oh wow! So yeah, it's been quite a good thing. Congratulations! Yeah. Oh man, there's trumpet players are mouthpiece freaks. <laughs> I mean, I don't yeah. know a trumpet player that doesn't have drawers full of mouthpieces they've tried <laughs> that they don't use anymore, That's including wow. me. If you, if we were on a visual right here, I'd go get you some mouthpieces. I have hundreds of mouthpieces from Whoa. over the years. I was going to ask what your collection of mouthpieces. Yeah, uh, yeah, oh yeah. But I'm, and I'm, you know, I have just few compared to some. Um, and then like my buddy Warren Looning, I mentioned. Yeah. He kind of played the mouthpiece that came with his horn his whole career. <laughs> You know, and, and never oh. searched, you, just, you know, <laughs> never had, you know, but we're always kind of, you know, with technology and things getting, we're all searching for something to make the job easier. Yeah. It's the same thing with trumpets. There's all these different trumpets and different manufacturers and, and trying to figure out what is best for that person. And like, we all hear something different and we all want, you know, something a little different feel wise. And so it's a, it's a, it's quite a business. I mean, the band and orchestra, you know, division of these companies are huge, huge, you know, money making uh, entities, you know. We kind of have a running topic on the podcast about people who have misheard Weird Al lyrics. Now, since you and your daughter are fans of Weird Al, were there any lyrics that you can think of that you had possibly misheard and then later found out were something else? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, 
But it's funny, and over the years, you, know, you think of all the different tunes, and when we were kids, we were singing along, and you, and then you realize later, God, that wasn't even the lyric when you see the lyrics written down. You've been singing the wrong thing, you know, like a Bob Dylan tune. You know, you can't understand half the things he's saying. You know, so. <laughs> was it, well, also because his stuff, you know, he's thinking about because he's doing a parody. He really has his diction and everything, and he has to make sure that everything is heard <laughs> as clearly as possible. Yeah. There's probably a lot of attention to detail that goes along with it. And I'm sure when they're mixing, there's certain words that need to come out that they're mixing up a little hotter. But even with that being said, you know, it could st somebody could still make the mistake and hear it as something else, you know. Yeah. The tunes that I, you know, miss hear the lyrics on over the years, I can't say because it would be dirty. It's, you know, we can't say this on your podcast. <laughs> like, oh, 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 it's magic. I won't tell you what that sounded like to me when I was a kid, that magic word. <laughs> but it wasn't magic. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> I just always used to laugh about it because even when I hear it now, because it's in a commercial and I hear it, it makes me crack up. <laughs> Wayne, this has been so much fun getting to hear about your career and working with Al and, and everything you've done. I definitely urge our listeners to head over to waynebergeron.com they can get all the information about your amazing career recording with all these different amazing musicians and performing with musicians and the soundtracks and tv shows and they can also check out your grammy nominated solo album you call this a living as well as your follow-up plays well with others in full circle and your newest single, A Tribute to Patrick Williams, Home to Emily. So much great information on your website that uh, that everyone can check out. Wayne, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and spending this time with us today. Oh, man, thank you so much. Yeah, they can buy a mouthpiece if they want to, even if they're not a trumpet player. They make excellent paperweights. <laughs> and the CDs, the CDs actually make great, if you buy four of them, they make great coasters. So if you don't like it, <laughs> you can have like, you can have some jazz coasters, you know, around the, around the house through a... But yeah, this has been really fun, and uh, this is very different for me. I do a lot of these kind of things, but of course, they're you know we're we're talking about jazz, or we're talking about the trumpet, or whatever. So it's been kind of fun to talk about an old dear friend, and uh, and I, I'm really proud uh, proud of him to see what he's done with his life and his career. And hopefully, I'll get to play with him again and do something with him uh, at some point. I'm sure he's writing away right now. That brain of his, you know, there's music ready to come out when this pandemic's over. He's going to have a <laughs> You can imagine what he's going to come up with. He's going to have a gazillion things, you know, based <laughs> yeah. on the politics and everything that's happened in COVID. And so I can hardly wait to hear what he comes up with next. Thank you for joining us, Wayne. That was so great. If you're interested in picking up any trumpet mouthpieces, you can do so over at waynebergeron.com, where you can also browse through his extensive discography and see all of his TV and film credits. We also want to send a big thank you to Wayne and Al's other classmate, Frank from the Bank Sanchez, for the great tip and getting us in touch with Wayne. This week's episode is brought to you in part by Discover Darwin, promoting tourism in Darwin, Minnesota. Not only is historic Darwin, Minnesota, uh, beautiful, it's also fun and factual. That's right! This week, we'll be featuring some fun facts about Darwin, Minnesota that you can memorize and impress your friends with. Did you know, Ethan, the population of Darwin, Minnesota, as of 2010, was 350? 350,000 people. Wow! No, I did not know that. No, not 350,000. Just 350. Oh. Oh, I see. Well, did you know, Dave, that the land area of Darwin, Minnesota is 0.75 square miles? Yeah, of course I knew that. How did you know that? I'm looking at the same Darwin, Minnesota community guide that you are. Ah, oh, oh yeah, that makes sense. So you'll also know that there are 153 housing units, but only 139 households. Huh? And that there are 2.52 persons per household. Wait, wait, how can there be 0.52 of a person? Is that where a torso boy lives? And the persons per square mile. Dave, tell me you know the persons per square mile. Uh, yeah, um, it's... Tell uh, me you know the person's per square mile, Dave! Great Googly Moogly, tell me! 466.67 persons per square mile. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so visit Darwin, Minnesota on your next expedition. Discover Darwin more than just the twine ball. And after you visit Darwin, Minnesota, be sure to visit discoverdarwin.biz. 
Each week, we're able to bring you this podcast absolutely free thanks to sponsors like Burrito Burrito, Angel Valenzuela and his son David Cash, Discover Darwin, Jackson Scoggins, David Grant, and our amazing close personal friend Patreon supporters, Jeff, Javier, Kenneth, Jared, Zeb, Mark, Blair, and Allison. We also give thanks to Mason and everyone else in our Patreon family. Revenue from our incredible supporters on Patreon.com slash 2000 Inch allows us to continue doing what we love, which is making fantastically fun, funny, and family-friendly Weird Al podcasts for you each and every week. We'd absolutely appreciate your consideration in joining our pretty sticky majestic Patreon family for as little as $1 per month. And remember... All of our Patreon supporters at the $5 and above tier get to join us at our two-year anniversary concert starring Trevor Strong of the Arrogant Worms on Saturday, May 8th. If you're already a member, be sure to RSVP. And if you're not yet a Patreon supporter and you want to attend, be sure to sign up now to reserve your spot. Head over to patreon.com slash 2000 inch. You won't regret it. Looking for another way to support the podcast? Head over to shop.2000inch.com for official Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast t-shirts, tote bags, mugs, tank tops, face masks, pillows, and so much more. Find us online at weirdalpodcast.com or 2000inch.com where you can find information about our guests and listen to past episodes, like episode 32inch where we interviewed Frank from the Bank Sanchez. Please join our Facebook group by heading to group.2000inch.com for episode discussions, exclusive content, and information on our upcoming game nights. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram via at 2000inch and at youtube.2000inch.com. Be sure to share our posts and tell your friends to gill and chill. And we love it when you leave us voicemail on our 27-hour-a-day podcast hotline, 347 Spatula. You might even hear your message on the air. You can catch our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or the podcast app of your choice. Whichever you choose, be sure to hit the subscribe button so you do not miss any episodes. New episodes drop every Wednesday. This year, we will begin airing our series of bonus episodes where we sit down with John Bermuda Schwartz and go page by page, picture by picture, inch by inch, MC by MC through his book, Black and White and Weird All Over. Time is running out for you to grab the book if you want to be able to follow along with those episodes. Plus, it's a great gift to give someone to celebrate the arrival of spring. Thank you once again to our guest, Wayne Bergeron, as well as Frank from the Bank Sanchez, Mike Fact Checker Minnick, Joe Brew Review Jaffa, UH Jeff Nucera, the Grammy Award winning Jim Kima West for our incredible theme song, and thanks to all of our listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters and sponsors, and everyone else who made this episode and the last 99 inches of this podcast possible. Next week, we celebrate Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, reaching episode 100-inch triple digits with our explosive interview with Weird Al's lifelong friend and confidant, Joel Miller. That was Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 99-inch, the original home to Mac and Squirt. Don't ask me.